السلام علیکم آن بہاف آف دی اسلامک ریسرچ فاؤنڈیشن وی ویلکم یو آل ٹو ٹو ڈیز پروگرام وی سٹارٹ دا پروگرام ود دا کراد بائی برادر اشرف محمدی السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الذین یأکلون الربا لا یقومون الا کما یقوم الذی تحبته الشيطان من المس ذلك بأنهم قالوا إنما البيع مثل الربا وأحو الله البيع وحرم الربا فمن جاءه موعزة من ربه فانتهى فله ما سلف وأمره إلا الله ومن عاد فأولئك أسحاب النار هم فيها خالدون يمحق الله الربا ويربي الصدقات والله لا يحب كل كفار أثيم إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وأقاموا الصلاة وآتوا الزكاة لهم أجرهم عند ربهم ولا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وذروا ما بقي من الربا إن كنتم مؤمنين فإن لم تفعلوا فأذنوا بحرب من الله ورسوله فَإِن لَّمْ تَفْعَلُوا فَأَذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَإِن تُبْتُمْ فَلَكُمْ رَؤُوسُ أَمْوَالِكُمْ لَا تَظْلِمُونَ وَلَا تُظْلَمُونَ وَإِن كَانَ ذُو عُشْرَةٍ فَنَظِرَةٌ إِلَى مَيْسَرَةٍ وَأَن تَصَدَّقُوا خَيْرٌ لَّكُمْ إِن كُنتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَظِيمُ I seek refuge with Allah from Satan, the accursed. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Those who devour usury will not stand except as stands one whom the evil has driven to madness by his touch. That is because they say, trade is like usury. But Allah has permitted trade and forbidden usury. Those who, after receiving direction from their Lord, desist shall be pardoned for the past. Their case is for God to judge. But those who repeat the offense 
are companions of the fire. They will abide therein forever. God will deprive usury of all blessing, but will give increase for deeds of charity. For he loves not creatures ungrateful and wicked. Those who believe and do deeds of righteousness and establish regular prayers and regular charity will have their reward with their Lord. On them shall be no fear, and nor shall they grieve. O you who believe, fear God, and give up what remains of your demand for usury, if ye are indeed believers. If ye do it not, if ye do it not, take notice of war from Allah and his messenger. But if you turn back, you shall have your capital sums. Deal not unjustly, and you shall not be dealt with unjustly. If the debtor is in a difficulty, grant him time till it is easy for him to repay. But if you remit by way of charity, that is the best for you, if you only knew. Verily, Allah speaks the truth. Assalamu alaikum. Those who have come in a bit later, I welcome you all to today's program once again. Economy has played a very important role for people, especially in terms of social justice as well as social welfare and its connection to problems and solutions to mankind all over the world. In this context, we at the Islamic Research Foundation dealing on various topics where there has been a great rethinking going on internationally like women's rights, human rights uh, and uh, various kinds of social justices and systems. Economy is in under close scrutiny as far as total solutions are concerned because many of the international organizations like the World Bank and those of leading economists of the world have been after pursuit of total solutions because at present what systems are going on in the world they have been fraught with certain problems and inadequacies which because of administrative excellence have been covered up to quite an extent in this view some people have been studying and have come forward to analyze Islamic economics one of the main key points of Islamic economics is interest-free and its relevance to society and success of society today. To speak before you all, we have today, once again, Dr. Zakir Naik on the topic, interest-free economy promulgated by the Quran. He'll basically be talking on the principles and we will have a question-answer session after that where we review the implementation. There are two factors which come into play when we study any system. One is the basic principle or the program, and the second is how you're going to implement it. I would request Dr. Zakir to start his talk, which will be followed by the question and answer session on the topic. Dr. Zakir Naik. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله وذروا ما بقي من الربا إن كنتم مؤمنين فإن لم تفلوا فذنوا بحرب من الله ورسوله وإن تبتم فلكم رؤوس وأموالكم لا تظلمون ولا تظلمون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. 
May peace, mercy, and blessings of Almighty Allah be on all of you. The topic of today's talk, as mentioned by the chairman, is interest-free economy promulgated by the Quran. The word riba is mentioned in the Quran no less than eight times. It's mentioned in Surah Room, chapter number 30, verse number 39. It's mentioned in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 161. It's mentioned in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 130. It's mentioned thrice in the verse of Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 275. And in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 276. And in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 278. The word riba is mentioned in the Quran no less than eight different times. <coughs> the first time the word riba was revealed in the Quran was in Surah Rum. Chapter number 30, verse number 39. It says that those who devour usury will have no increase with Allah. But those who give out in deeds of charity, seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will have increased. And they will have a recompense multiplied. The word riba, the Arabic word riba means an addition to or an increase over and above the original amount or the original size. In the Quran, it refers to as unlawful addition. And it means usury as well as interest. <coughs> the first time the Quran mentioned in the chronological order, in the chronological order regarding riba, it does not say that it is prohibited. It only says, as I mentioned, in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 39, that those who give out in usury will have no increase with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But those who give out in deeds of charity will have increased, and they shall have a recompense multiplied. Regarding riba, it is somewhat similar to what the Quran says about intoxicants. The prohibition of intoxicants was revealed in stages. The first time the Quran speaks about intoxicants is in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 219, and it says that when they asked he concerning intoxicants and gambling, tell them, in it is some profit, but great sin. The sin is greater than the profit. The first time the Quran reveals regarding intoxicants, it only said that in it is great sin and some profit. The sin is greater than profit. It did not prohibit us from consuming intoxicants. Later on, the second verse of the Quran to be revealed regarding intoxicants was of Surah Nisa, chapter number 4. Verse number 43, which says that approach not your prayers with a mind befogged. Approach not your prayers when you're intoxicated. Finally, later on, it was revealed regarding the prohibition of intoxicants in Surah Maida, chapter number 5. Verse number 90, which says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amunu, O you who believe, in the khamru al maithuru. Most certainly intoxicants and gambling. Well, Anzabu al Aslamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, Rikhsum min amali shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork. These are abominations of Satan's handiwork. Abstain from such handiwork that you may prosper. After this verse was revealed, barrels of intoxicants were thrown on the streets of Medina, never to be filled again. So the prohibition of intoxicants came in stages, in the same fashion. The first time 
the word riba was mentioned, it only said that you will have no increase with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next verse to be revealed regarding riba was from Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 161, which says that for the iniquities of the Jews, we made for them unlawful certain foods which were good and wholesome and which were lawful to them. Because they hindered many from Allah's way and they took usury which had been forbidden to them, which had been prohibited to them. So certain food which is mentioned in the Quran, that is meat of camel, of sheep, of goat, fat of the ox, of the hare. These particular things, the meat of the camel, the meat of the rabbit, and the meat of the hare, and the fat of the ox, the sheep, and the goat, though it was good and wholesome, had been prohibited to the Jews, because they hindered many from Allah's way, and they took riba, they took usury, they took interest, though it was prohibited to them. Later on, the Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 130, which says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amunu, O you who believe, la taqulu riba, devour not usury, ad afam, muda afatan, doubled and multiplied. O you who believe, devour not usury, doubled and multiplied. But fear Allah that you may really prosper. Here the Quran says that devour not usury, doubled and multiplied. But fear Allah that you may really prosper. But some of the Muslims may argue that the riba mentioned in the Quran only refers to usury, somewhat similar to what the money lenders when they gave loan to people and they took an exorbitant amount. Quran prohibits usury, but Quran does not prohibit interest, which the modern day banks take. Let's analyze what's the meaning of usury and what's the meaning of interest. According to the Oxford Dictionary, the word interest means amount paid for the use of amount lent. Money paid for the use of money lent. And usury, according to the Oxford Dictionary, means the act or practice of lending money at interest, especially at a very high rate. So in short, usury means exorbitant interest. But as I mentioned earlier, riba means an addition to or an increase above the original amount of size. It is unlawful addition and here it refers to both usury as well as interest irrespective whether the rate is small or big. Riba, whether it be interest or usury, it has been prohibited in the Quran. Some Muslims may further argue that interest is like trade. So what is the harm in involving yourself dealing with interest? The answer to this argument is given clearly in the Quran. The same verse which was left, which was decided by Akari. The answer is given in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2. Verse number 275, he says that those who devour usury will not stand except as stands one who the evil one by his touch has driven to madness. This is because they say that trade is like usury, trade is like interest. Allah has permitted trade but has forbidden riba, has forbidden usury, has forbidden interest. Those who after receiving the duration from thy Lord desist, they shall be pardoned for the past. Their case is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to judge. 
But those who repeat the offense will be companions of the hellfire. Therein will they dwell forever. The Quran clearly states that Allah has permitted trade but has forbidden interest and riba. And those who involve themselves in riba, that is usury or interest, will be companions of the hellfire. And therein shall they dwell in forever. The verse continues. The next verse of Surah Bakra, chapter number 2, verse number 276 says, Allah will deprive riba. Allah will deprive usury of all its blessings and will give multiple increase for deeds of charity. Some Muslims may further argue that the riba mentioned in the Quran refers to riba istilaq. That is when a person gives a loan to another person to purchase his basic necessities to fulfill the basic demands of life. If a person gives loan and then charges interest on such loan, this sort of riba, which is called as riba istalaq, has been prohibited. The other sort of riba, the other interest which the modern banks take, interest giving on loans for doing business, this the Quran does not prohibit. Let's analyze what the Quran has to say. I start my talk by reciting a few verses of the Qur'an. I recited the verse from Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2. Verse number 278 which says, Ya ayyuhal Allah, That, O oh, you who believe, fear Allah. Wazaru ma baqi minar riba. And give up your demands. And give up your demands of riba. That is usury or interest. In kuntum mu'mineen, if ye are indeed believers, immediately after this voice was revealed, our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, he said that I am the first person to let go, to nullify the interest which is due to my relative, Hazrat Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib. May Allah be pleased with him. Previously, in the pre-Islamic Arabia, there were two types of business that was done. One was the mudariba system. That is, a person gave loan to a mudarib, to a, a businessman, to a person who's doing trade. And whatever profit that businessman had, it was shared between the person who gave loan and the businessman. And the second type was money was given to a businessman and a fixed interest was charged on that money. When the Muslims say that the riba which is prohibited in the Quran refers to riba istilaq, that is interest on loan givings to basic necessities like for purchasing food, for purchasing clothes, the basic requirement. Such type of riba has been prohibited. The moment the verse of Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 278 was revealed, which said that give up your demands of usury, give up your demands of riba, give up your demands of interest. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, he was the first to nullify, he was first to let go the interest that was due to his relative. Hazrat Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, may Allah be pleased with him. No logical person, no logical Muslim can say that the beloved, rela the beloved relative of a prophet, Hazrat Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, may Allah be pleased with him, he gave loan to poor people for basic needs and in return charged interest, just like what the Jews did. But natural, Hazrat Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, may Allah be pleased with him, he gave loan to businessmen to do business. And on that, he charged a fixed interest. After this verse was revealed, whatever interest which was due to his relative was let go. And but natural, 
all the Muslims of that time, whoever involved themselves in interest, let go whatever interest amount was due to them. The next verse, immediately after this verse, is of Surah Bakra, chapter number 2, verse number 279, which says, after it says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanatu kulla, O you believe, fear Allah. Wazaru ma baqi minar riba, and give up what remains of a demand of usury. In kuntum mu'mineen, if you are indeed believers. And the next verse says, Fa'in, fa'in tawallaw. If, but if you do it not, Fa'zanu biharb min Allah wa rasulihi. Take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. Wa in tuptum. But if you turn back. Wa in tuptum. But if you turn back. You can have your capital sums. The Quran clearly states that if you do not turn back from riba, take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. Imagine, the Quran also mentioned that intoxicants are prohibited. Gambling is prohibited. But nowhere does the Quran say that though consuming intoxicants is a major sin, it does not say that if you consume intoxicants, Allah and His Rasul will wage a war against you. Neither do you indulge. If you indulge in gambling, will Allah and His Rasul wage a war against you. But yes, specifically the Quran says, if you involve yourself in interest, Allah and His Rasul will wage a war against you. I want to know that which Muslim today in the world, in the world today, can challenge Allah and His Rasul for a war? I want to know which Muslim, which human being today in this world, can challenge Allah and His Rasul for a war? If you involve yourself in interest, in usury, you are challenging Allah and His Rasul for a war. And the next verse of Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 280 continues, that if the debtor is in difficulty, give him time to repay until it is easy for him to repay. But if he give it in deeds of charity, that is best for you. Regarding riba, the prohibition, has also been mentioned in several hadiths. It is clearly mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 6, chapter number 48, 49, 50 and 51. That is hadith number 64, 65, 66 and 67. The first three hadiths, that is hadith number 64, 65 and 66 of volume 6 of Sahih Bukhari says, that Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, she narrated that after the last verses of Surah Baqarah was revealed to Allah's Messenger, may Allah be pleased with him, may peace be upon him, he went out and repeated that in the mosque and prohibited the trade of alcohol and liquor. And the last hadith, Hadith number 67 says that the hadith was narrated by Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, that the last verses of the Quran to be revealed were verses prohibiting riba. These seven verses, that is from Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 275 to verse number 281, were the last seven verses of the Quran to be revealed. And immediately after the revelation, a few days later on, our beloved Prophet, may peace be upon him, he expired. That's the reason that the companion did not have much time to know the minute details of the implication of the Sharia. And it's mentioned in the commentary of Ibn Qasir that Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he said, he had wished that the beloved Prophet had thrown more light on three things. One being riba, 
and the other two being Khilafa and Kalala. That is how a property of a diseased person who has no relatives, how it should be divided, which is mentioned in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 12. But from the hadiths you can come to know clearly, besides the mention in the Quran, it's also mentioned in the Sahih Hadiths. If you read the index, that is the glossary of Sahih Bukhari in volume 1, under the topic of riba, it said riba is of two types. Riba nasiya, that is loan given to a person for business and interest charged on that loan. And riba fadal, that is exchanging a superior quality of good in turn for a bigger quantity of inferior quality of good, irrespective it may be gold, silver, foodstuff, etc. And it says all types of riba are prohibited. The prohibition of riba is also clearly mentioned in Sahih Muslim in volume 3, in chapter number 623, hadith number 3845 to 3849. Five hadiths which clearly mention in Sahih Muslim that riba is prohibited. Let us analyze what are the objectives of the Islamic economic order. Why does Quran promulgate an interest-free economy? There are basically four objectives for an interest-free economy promulgated by the Quran. The first is the economic well-being within the framework of the moral norms of Islam. The second is universal brotherhood and justice. The third is equitable distribution of wealth. And the fourth is individual freedom within the context of social welfare. <coughs> Let's analyze the first objective, that is economic well-being within the framework of the moral norms of Islam. The Quran mentioned in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 68, that eat and drink of the sustenance provided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and create no mischief or evil on the face of the earth. A similar thing is repeated in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 160, which says that each of the producers of the earth and follow not the footsteps of the evil one, for he is to you an avowed enemy. It further mentions Surah Juma. Chapter number 62, verse number 10, that after the prayer is finished, disperse ye in the land to seek the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From these verses you can realize that the Quran encourages the people to enjoin the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to enjoy the good things which Allah has provided for you. It is mentioned in the hadith narrated on the authority of al bayaki that the person who seeks the world lawfully to cater to the need of a family, to avoid begging and to be kind to his neighbor will meet Allah with a shining face like the full moon. Begging has been discouraged in Islam. It's also mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, chapter number 2, sorry, volume number 2, page number 133, that the hand that is above is better than the hand that is below. It's also mentioned in the Hadith of Ibn Majah, volume 2, page number 723. It says 
that the best income a person can earn is through his labor. So Islam encourages the person to enjoy the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to work for his living and to refrain from begging. The second objective is universal brotherhood and justice. The best verse that I can quote to you from the Quran regarding universal brotherhood is from Surah Al-Hujurat, chapter number 49. Verse number 13, which says that, O oh humankind, we have created you from a single pair of a male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other, not that you shall despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who is the most righteous is the person who is the most pious. From this verse you come to know the criteria for judgment in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not sex, it is not wealth, it is not caste, it is not color, but it is taqwa. It is God consciousness. It is piety. Further we also come to know that during the speech of the farewell pilgrimage of Hajjatul Vida, our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, he said that no Arab is superior to a non Arab, neither a white is superior to a black, except in righteousness, except in piety, except in God consciousness. The best word that I can quote from the Quran regarding justice is from Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 135, which says that, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amunu, O you who believe, stand out firmly for justice as witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it be against yourself, against your parents, against your relatives, or the rich or poor. For Allah protects all. Means if you have to stand for truth, if you have to stand for haq, if you have to give a witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can even go against yourself. You have to sacrifice your own interest. You can even go against your parents, against the relatives, or irrespective of the person we are going against is rich or poor. You have to stand firmly for justice as witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third objective is equitable distribution of the income, of the wealth. Islam is again the philosophy that the wealth should be concentrated in the hands of few individuals. And the difference between the rich and the poor should be reduced. Otherwise, they will be enemies unto each other. For this, Islam has devised a system called a zakat. That every Muslim who has a saving, who has a wealth of more than the nisab level, more than the minimum wealth required, he has to pay 2.5%, one fortieth of that wealth every lunar year to the poor people. And the categories to whom zakat can be given has been clearly listed in the Quran in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 60, which says that zakat can be, give, zakat can be given to a fuqara, to a person who is poor. It can be given to a masakin, a person who is needy. It can be given to Amilun, a person who is engaged in collecting and distributing the zakat. It can be given to Mu'alla Fatukulub, those whose hearts, those whose hearts are inclined towards Islam, that is the converts or the reverts. It can be given to the Rikab, that is the captives. It 
can be given to the Gari Moon, that is, the one who has taken loan, can be given to the debtor. The seventh category is Ibn Sabil, that is the wayfarer, the traveler. Even though he's rich, if he gets stranded in a foreign land, and if he does not have money to go back or for his sustenance, you can give him out of the zakat money. And the last category is Peaceabilillah, in the way of Allah. And this last category is further subdivided. In this category of Peaceabilillah, it can be given to a person who is giving religious education, person who is acquiring religious education, the person who is involved in doing jihad in the way of Allah, striving, struggling, doing holy war in the way of Allah. It can be given to a da'i. It can be also given to a person who is obtaining the secular education. The several categories. This system of zakat has been specified. The reason which is given in the Quran in Surah Al-Hashar, chapter number 59, verse number 7, to prevent the wealth from circulating amongst the wealthy and rich. The zakat has been devised to prevent the wealth from circulating amongst the rich and the wealthy. If every individual in this world practices the system of zakat, there will not be a single human being who will die of hunger in this world. Unfortunately, even the Muslims don't give the correct zakat that is due to them. They may give part of it, only a small percentage. If every Muslim in this world gives zakat correctly, there will not be a single Muslim below the poverty line. Islam teaches that to find lawful employment to the person who is unemployed and to give him a good remuneration for the work he does. The Quran also says that after a person dies, his wealth should be divided according to the guidelines laid in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 11, 12, and verse number 176. It should not go to one or two individuals of the society, how it is done today that whatever wealth is remaining of a person who dies, it goes to one or two individuals. But the Quran specifies the wealth should be distributed according to the guidelines laid in the Quran. The fourth objective is individual freedom within the context of the social welfare. <coughs> According to Islam, a man is born free. No one, not even the state, can abrogate his freedom, nor subject his life to strict regimentation. Every individual is free as long as he does not overstep his freedom, as long as he does not harm the society. Because in Islam, the larger welfare of society takes precedence over the individual freedom. Working and labor, working and labor as well as the benefit in business are both important principles of the Sharia, but the first, the former, takes precedence over the latter. And if you are doing business, or whatever it is, a big loss, a big loss cannot be inflicted to relieve a small loss. Neither can a big profit be sacrificed for a small profit. So in short, Islam believes in individual freedom within the context of the social welfare. 
there are several evils of the interest based economy the reason why quran has prohibited it for example if a person takes loan from the bank and says the cost price of a particular article is 100 rupees he wants 10 rupees profit on that article so his selling price will include the 100 rupees cost price the 10 rupees profit as well as the interest is paying say it is rupees 10 so the selling price will be 120 rupees the selling price will go up because of interest if the selling price goes up but natural the demand comes down when the demand comes down the supply goes down when supply goes down but natural the production comes down when the production comes down there is retrenchment and there is labor problem there is problem of employment there are a lot of social injustice for example if a person takes loan from the bank irrespective whether he makes a profit or goes in loss he has to pay that fixed amount of interest in the time stipulated even if some calamity befalls his family like flood earthquake etc still the person who has taken loan has to pay that amount along with interest there is no social there is there is social injustice irrespective whether the business man goes in loss or profit he has to pay that amount there is no social consideration also for example if two businessmen if two businessmen they come to ask for a loan from a bank from the modern bank <clears throat> one businessman wants to open an alcohol factory and the other businessman wants to start a school but natural the person starting an alcohol factory will have better returns and the loan given to him will be more secured and he will give a higher rate of interest as compared to the other businessman who wants to start a school or an hospital there is no social consideration the modern bank is only interested in getting bigger returns it's not bothered whether you open an alcohol factory or a gambling den or a school or a hospital that's the reason that if you analyze in the 80s most of the modern banks they financed gambling dens that the reason you you will find that hundreds and thousands of gambling dens had been opened in the 80s throughout the world all the banks financed gambling dens gambling dens gambling dens the theoretically the modern banker will tell you that even we have social consideration and for name sake he may give a loan to a few social projects but majority of his loans that we analyze are not based on social consideration it's based on better interest according to the modern banking it encourages a person to store money it encourages a person to keep the money idle that you that you keep so much money in the bank and you get a fixed return of 10% or 12% every year it encourages a person to store money and lastly the power is concentrated in the hands of few people that is the bankers that's the reason that a small percentage of people that is a small community that is the jews which are controlling the major modern banks of the world today they are controlling the full world the power today is mainly in the hands of the jews because though they are negligible in percentage they are controlling most of the modern banks so because of the modern banking system power is concentrated in the hands of few individuals same way there are several benefits of the islamic banking firstly 
No interest is involved. It's based on profit and loss. So if a person wants to sell his good, it will only have the cost price and the profit. Instead of 120 rupees, his selling price will be 110 rupees. If the selling price comes down, the demand increases. If the demand increases, but natural supply increases. Supply increases, the production increases. And but natural, there is more labor for the people. And it encourages the people to work and to strive. It encourages a people to earn the living. It has social justice. That if a businessman takes a loan, if he goes in loss, the loss is shared by the bank. If he goes in profit, the profit is shared by the bank. And if he takes a loan, and if certain calamity befalls him, but natural, the Islamic bank gives him more time to repay, not like the modern bank. The more later you pay, you have to pay a bigger penalty. In the Islamic bank, they give more time. And many a time, if they find the situation very bad, they also let go of that loan. There is social consideration. You cannot give loan to any businessman who is doing any activity against the Islamic Sharia. Any activity which is causing harm to the society. For example, if a businessman wants to open an alcohol factory and if he approaches an Islamic bank, irrespective, even if the businessman says, I will give you 100% of my profit, still the Islamic bank will not give a single pie loan to that businessman because he wants to start a project which is harmful to the society, which is against the Sharia. So in the Islamic banking, there is social consideration. And they encourage more, the Islamic bank, they encourage more of the projects which are beneficial to the society. For example, building of schools, building of hospitals, building of nurseries, etc. In short, the Islamic bank encourages the society to improve. <clears throat> In Islamic bank, you aren't encouraged to keep your money idle. You're encouraged to invest your money and be a partner in the business. And lastly, the power is not concentrated in the hands of a few individuals. Because here, the profit and loss is shared by the businessman, by the banker, as well as the depositor. The power is shared equally between all the people. It's not concentrated in the hands of the few people. The great philosopher Aristotle, he has given a beautiful definition of interest. And Aristotle defines interest as an earning based on the use of money and not on labor. And all such earnings are against nature. According to Aristotle, interest is an earning based on the use of money, not on labor. And all such earnings, that is, all such interest are against nature. Let's analyze the modern theory and the Islamic theory. There are mainly four factors that are involved in production. The first is land, second is labor, third is capital, and fourth is organization. According to the modern theory, on land, you pay rent. In the Islamic theory, you do the same. On land, you pay rent. <clears throat> In the second factor of production, that is labor. In the modern theory, you pay wages. In the Islamic theory also, you pay wages. It's the same. In the third factor of production, that is capital. In the modern theory, you pay interest. In the Islamic theory, there is profit and loss sharing. And in the fourth factor of production, that is organization, in the modern theory, there is profit and loss sharing. In the Islamic theory, there is profit and loss sharing. So the major difference in the four factors of production is the third factor, that is capital. The modern theory says that on the capital, you have to charge a fixed interest. The Islamic theory says 
that on the capital there is profit and loss sharing. Because Islam does not differentiate between the capital and the organization. Because the money that is lent by the bank, the money actually does not belong to the bank. It belongs to the depositors. So depositors are part of organization. Therefore, the money that is given, borrowed from the bank, the money which is deposited in the bank, this money, this capital should be included in the organization. That is the reason capital and organization in the Islamic theory, they are clubbed together. And it is based on profit and loss sharing. In the modern theory, capital, on the capital you have interest. This is the major difference. The five basic principles of the Islamic banking are, the first is Tawheed, that is belief in one God, that is unity of God. <coughs> the second is divine, divine origin of nourishment and direction towards perfection. The third, it is Khilafa. We have to realize that man is the wise gerent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the face of the earth. The fourth is Taskiya, that is purification and growth. And last is accountability, that we have to believe in the year after. And we will be accountable on the day of judgment. Islamic banking is mainly based on these five principles. When you have to do business, normally there are two types of units. One is the surplus unit which has got excess of money but does not know how to utilize it. The other is the deficit unit. That is, those people who have got no money but have got very good ideas. The best example in Islamic history I can give you of a surplus and a deficit unit is the Hazrat Khatija, may Allah be pleased with her, who was the wife of beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him. She is a very good example of a surplus unit. She had excess of wealth. But since she was a lady, but naturally she could not go abroad and involve too much in the business transaction. She did not have avenues to invest her money. And the example of the deficit unit is our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him. That is deficit in the terms of money. He did not have much wealth, but he had a lot of ideas. So both these units combined, the surplus and the deficit unit. Bibi Khatija, may Allah be pleased with her. She gave her money to Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, to do business. And whatever profit they obtained, it was shared on the ratio that was predetermined. The best example you have in Islamic history of a deficit and a surplus unit. Let's analyze the system of modern banking and Islamic banking. Let's first analyze the options open for an individual to deposit the money in an Islamic bank. The first type of account you have for deposit account is the current account. It is called as Vadia Infix. That you deposit your money in the Islamic bank, in the current account. That money which the Islamic bank takes, it utilizes that money with your permission. You give permission to the bank to utilize that money. But if the bank goes in loss, the loss is not shared by the depositor. If the bank goes in profit, neither is the profit shared by the depositor. The depositor only keeps the money for safety. It's called as amana. He keeps his wealth for safety. He is not interested in profit, neither in loss. He keeps his money for safety. And Islamic Sharia gives the permission that you are allowed to keep your money as amanat with anyone and you can utilize it. At the same time, the Islamic bank gives you a check and a slip book. 
But naturally, with the checkbook, you can withdraw money whenever you want. And with the slip book, you can put in money whenever you want, similar to the modern bank. Coming to the second type of deposit account, it is a savings account. In the savings account, here also, the depositor is mainly interested in the safety of his money. He is not interested in profit and loss. And whatever profit the bank obtains from that money, the depositor does not mind accepting a part of it. The Sharia says, whatever profit you obtain from a business, you have a right to give a part of it as gift, a part of it as gift to anyone. It's called a satka. You can give a satka. So here you deposit your money in the Islamic bank and whatever profit the bank makes, the bank gives you a portion of the profit. But you cannot demand a fixed amount of profit. It's not allowed in Islam. Whatever the bank gives, you have to accept it. And the remaining profit, it's considered as you have given it back to the bank. You have a right to give back a profit to whoever you wish, according to Islamic Sharia. So these two accounts, the current account and the savings account, the depositors are mainly interested in the safety of the money. They aren't interested in profit. The other type of account that you have are the investment accounts. Or in the modern banks, they are similar to the fixed deposit account. And this are further divided into several types. In the Islamic system, in the Islamic banking system, you have the mudareba, which means profit and loss sharing. That the person, the depositor, keeps, keeps an amount for a fixed period of time. The period of time may be multiples of three months. It can be three months, it can be six months, it can be nine months, it can be twelve months. This example I'm giving you of the Islamic banking is based on the Islamic banking in Malaysia. The best banking that you have today, the Islamic banking you have today in the world is the Malaysian banking. There is no better Islamic banking anywhere in the world than the Islamic banking followed in Malaysia. In the other countries, they partly follow Islamic banking, partly they don't. But the 100% system, which I have in my knowledge, the only country which is following 100% to the minutest detail is in Malaysia. So this concept, I'm telling you, is based on the Islamic system of banking in Malaysia. In this investment account, that's called a mudariba, you keep a fixed amount of wealth for a fixed period, maybe for three months, for six months, nine months, twelve months, or whatever it is, multiples of three months. Some banks keep it for multiples of four months. This money, in turn, is used by the bank to do business with the businessman. So in the terminology, when you deposit your money in the bank, the depositor is called as sahib -e mal And the bank is called as sahib -e amal Here the surplus unit is the depositor. The deficit unit is the Islamic bank. Now whatever profit the Islamic bank makes, it is shared on a predetermined ratio. The profit which the Islamic bank makes or the money you have deposited for the fixed period is shared on the ratio which is determined. In the Islamic banking of Malaysia, the ratio is seven parts to three parts. Seven parts of the profit is given to the depositor, three parts of the profit is, is kept with the bank. Means 70% of the profit goes to the depositor and 30% the Islamic bank keeps for itself. For example, if you deposit 1,000 rupees in the Islamic Bank of Malaysia for one year and the bank makes a profit of 100 rupees, so bank will give you 70 rupees of the profit and will keep 30 rupees of the profit. But as the capital also you get back, but the profit you will get 70%, 70 rupees and the bank will give 30 rupees. If the bank makes a profit of 500 rupees, the bank keeps 30% of 500 rupees, that is 150 rupees. 
and gives you 70% of the profit. That is, gives you 350 rupees. So, bigger the profit, bigger is the share of, of the depositor as well as the bank. Lesser is the profit, lesser is the share of the depositor as well as the bank. It is profit sharing. If the profit is zero rupees, the bank gets zero, the depositor gets zero. But suppose in case the bank goes in loss, according to the Mudariba system, the loss is borne only by the depositor. The loss in the business is theoretically only borne by the depositor. Means, for example, if you invest 1000 rupees and keep it for one year, there is a loss of 100 rupees. So you, in turn, the loss is transferred to you. And from your capital, out of the 1000 rupees, you only get 900 rupees back. 100 rupees is deducted as loss. <coughs> so in theoretical terms, the loss is only borne by the depositor. But practically, even the Islamic bank is going in loss. Because, but natural, they are paying the money for the administration, for the rent, for the salary, which is not taken into account. So, but natural, even the bank is not going scot-free. Even the bank is sharing a loss, though it is a lesser percentage as compared to the depositor. This is the system in the Islamic banking. Now, let's come to the project financing. Suppose a businessman, he wants a loan. He wants money from the Islamic bank. The first system is the Mudariba system. That is, a businessman comes to the bank and says that <coughs> I have a project of six months. And this project requires 50,000 rupees. At the end of six months, I will make I will get a return of 1 lakh rupees, that is 50,000 rupees profit. Is the Islamic bank willing to give me 50,000 rupees for 6 months? But naturally the Islamic bank analyzes the business, what sort of business is he doing, is, is the business viable, what is the profit return, etc, etc. Then the Islamic bank and the entrepreneur and the businessman, they sit across the table and they finalize the ratio of profit that they should share. Say for example, the Islamic bank says, I will take three parts of the profit, the businessman gets two parts of the profit. Means 60% of the profit, whatever the businessman is making, will go to the Islamic bank, 40% will go to the entrepreneur, to the businessman. The deal is fixed, it can be negotiated. In the modern bank, the interest is negotiated. In the Islamic bank, the profit ratio is negotiated. So the businessman says, I require 50,000 for doing business, for six months. In that 50,000, also, if he's working for his business, his salary is included. If he's not working, if he employs other people only, his salary is not included. But if he also works, say for example, an average person working may require 2,000 per month. So, he gets paid 2,000 per month from that 50,000 rupees. For six months it will come, six multiplied by 2,000, he gets 12,000 rupees at the end of six months. This is taken into account. And the remaining, the remaining money, the remaining 38,000 of the 50,000 is utilized on buying of goods and the administration. So from the 50,000, even 12,000 salary of that entrepreneur for six months is taken into account. Now after six months, he makes a profit of 50,000. He gets the total return of 1 lakh rupees. But natural, the capital sum of 50,000 is, is given back to the bank. And the remaining 50,000 profit is shared on the profit ratio predetermined. Bank, Islamic bank, takes 60%, that is 30,000 rupees. And the businessman keeps 40% of the 20,000 rupees. So at the end of six months, the businessman gets 20,000 rupees profit as well as 12,000 rupees salary for his labor. If instead of making 50,000 profit, the businessman makes 40,000 profit. So the bank takes 60% of 40,000. That is 24,000 rupees. And the businessman, he takes 40% of the 40,000. He keeps 16,000. If the businessman makes 60,000 profit, 
the bank keeps 60 percent of 60,000. That is 36,000 rupees of profit. And the businessman keeps 40 percent. That is 24,000 rupees of the profit. So bigger the profit, bigger is the share for the Islamic bank as well as the businessman. Lesser is the profit, lesser is the share for the businessman and the bank. But suppose, but suppose the businessman goes in loss. The complete loss is borne by the Islamic bank. And the bank in turn passes that loss to the depositor. But technically, even the businessman going in loss for his thinking, for the time he has wasted, six months, etc. He has been paid for the labor, but not for the other charges. For his thinking, for his whatever, whatever ideas he had. Technically, even he's going in loss. The major difference in Mudaraba system is that the bank has no right to interfere with the management of the business of the entrepreneur. It can take accountability every month, every week, no problem, how the business is running. But it can't interfere with the management. Suppose the businessman wants to build a building of 10 stories. So the bank cannot say, instead of 10 stories, build more, 12 stories. You can't interfere with the business. Instead of using A-grade cement, you use B-grade cement for more profit. The bank cannot interfere with the management of the businessman in the Mudaraba system. The second type of trading is called as a Musharika system. It's called as partnership. In this, the bank has a right to interfere with the management of the business. It can give guidance. It can tell that instead of producing a particular article, you can produce another article. Instead of building a 10-story building, you build a 12-story building. In this system of Musharika, the businessman has got part of the capital. The part of the capital it takes from the bank. Now, depending upon the ratio of investment, suppose both have paid 50%, 50% capital is paid by the businessman, 50% capital is paid, is paid by the bank. Whatever profit is there is again shared in the ratio which is paid to mine. Say, for example, it's 50%, 50%. Whatever profit the people make, 50% goes to the bank, 50% goes to the businessman. If there is loss, the loss is also shared on a predetermined ratio. In the Mudariba system, the loss is completely borne by the bank. In the Musharika system, the loss is shared on a predetermined ratio. Though the ratio is different from the sharing of profit. Suppose the sharing of profit is 50% by the bank, 50% by the businessman. The sharing of loss is at a different ratio. The bank bears more loss. For example, the bank, if the business goes in loss, the bank will share 60% of the loss and the businessman will share 40% of the loss. This is the Musharika system. The third type is the Murhaba. In the Murhaba system, <coughs> suppose you want to purchase a particular machinery from Japan. The machinery costs one lakh rupees. In the modern bank, you open an LC, a letter of credit, or a TR, it's called trust receipt. And you put the money in the bank, and the bank buys the machinery from Japan, the modern bank, and whatever time it takes for the transaction, it charges a fixed interest on that. In the Islamic bank, you put the amount in the Islamic bank. The businessman, since he does not want to go to Japan to buy the machinery, he tells the Islamic bank, you buy the machinery for me, on my behalf. So you put that money as wakala in the bank, one lakh rupees, or whatever the amount is, you put. And the Islamic bank, buys the machinery on behalf of the businessman. And the Islamic bank, when it gets the machinery, it has a right to charge a profit, a commission or service charge, whatever you call it. Say the Islamic bank says that we buy the machinery for one lakh rupees from Japan, when we give it to you in Bombay, we want 3,000 rupees profit. 
or 3,000 rupees commission or 3,000 rupees service charge. Islam gives permission. It's called in the Islamic terminology as ujara. It's allowed in Islam. Profit is allowed. But this profit can be negotiable. The businessman can say, instead of 3,000, you take a profit of 2,500, or whatever it is. The profit is negotiable. Suppose you have part of the finance, or you don't have finance at all for purchasing that particular machinery, you can interlink, you can combine Murhaba system with the Mudariba or with Musharika. For example, you have part of the money, or you have no finance at all. Say you don't have one like at all. You tell the Islamic bank, I want to purchase that money, uh, I want to purchase that machinery for one lakh rupees, and after it comes to Bombay, I will make a profit of say 20,000 rupees on that machinery. Now they are dealing a transaction of Mudariba, that the Islamic bank buys the machinery and gives it to the businessman. And the businessman says that within a few months or within a few days, I will sell that machinery and get a profit of 20,000 rupees. That profit is shared between the bank and, and the businessman and the Mudarib on a ratio which is pretty determined. For example, the bank says, since they are giving 100% finance, we want 60% profit. The 20% profit goes to the businessman since he is not putting a single pie. So out of the 20,000 profit that the businessman takes, that he makes, besides returning the 1 lakh rupees capital, he also gives back a profit of 60% of the 20,000 rupees, say rupees 12,000. And the remaining 40%, remaining 8,000, he keeps for himself. This is called as the Mudariba, along with Murhaba. The other is the Musharika along with Murhaba, that the businessman has part of the finance. Say, of the 1 lakh rupees, he has 50,000 rupees. So, he says 50,000 invested by the bank, 50,000 by the businessman. And whatever profit they have, is again divided on the ratio that is predetermined. There is another system in the Islamic banking called as Ijara. In the modern terminology, it can be called as leasing or higher purchase. <coughs> that suppose you want, you don't want to buy that machinery or vehicle. Suppose there's a car you want for two lakh rupees. You don't want to buy it. You just want to rent it. So the Islamic bank says we are willing to rent this vehicle. Rent the Maruti car which costs about 2 lakh rupees to you. And the rent is based on the lifespan of that vehicle. Say suppose Maruti van or Maruti car can last for 5 years. And the Islamic bank says, I want a profit of 1 lakh rupees. So the cost price of the car, 2 lakh rupees, is added with the profit they want 1 lakh rupees. 3 lakh. It's going, the car will run for five years, that is 60 months. So the 3 lakh rupees amount, the cost plus the profit is divided equally between 60 months. It comes to 5,000 rupees. So you rent that Maruti car to that businessman for 5,000 rupees per month. That businessman is not interested in buying the car. If the businessman says, after three years, I may have part of the money to buy it back. It's called as Ijara ending with sale. So the bank will say, the Islamic bank, for three years we want a profit of 80,000 rupees. So two lakh of the car, add of 80,000 comes to two lakh 80,000 rupees. He keeps on paying 5,000 rupees every month. At the end of three years, he pays approximately one lakh 80,000 rupees. Still one lakh is due. So the businessman pays that one lakh rupees lump sum to the Islamic bank and buys the car. So in the Islamic banking system, there is renting, ijara, along with buying back facility. In the modern bank, the car is on your name, it's only hypothetical to the bank. And the modern bank will never buy back the car. In the Islamic bank, if you don't want the car, the car remains with the Islamic bank. 
So the businessman, when he takes a loan from Islamic Bank, has the option of buying back the car or keeping the car with the bank. <coughs> Coming to the last type of system in the Islamic Bank is Karz e Hassan. Karz means loan, Hassan means beautiful. That is, loan is given to a person who is poor without interest. There is no equivalent of Karz e Hassan in any system of modern banking. There is nothing like interest free loan in the modern bank at all. My Islamic Bank, for example, Malaysia, 10% of the profit, they keep it separately for Karz e Hassan. This fund is given to the poor people who are encouraged to do business. Say, suppose they want 2,000 rupees or 5,000 rupees or whatever amount for a period of one year or two years. The bank will say, okay, we give you 5,000 rupees or 10,000 rupees for two years. You do business and return that money back to us after two years. <coughs> but national guarantees are taken if possible. If the businessman who is poor goes in a profit, if he wants, he can give part of the profit to the bank. If he does not want, he need not give. He is not forced to give a single pie extra than the money he has taken. Willingly, if he wants to give a part of it to you, to the bank, he is most willing. But, technically, he has to only return the amount he has taken back. This is called as Karzi Hassan. And the reference is given in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 245. That who will loan to Allah, a beautiful loan, which Allah will double and multiply unto his account. The word Karz is mentioned in the Quran. That if you want to give a loan, give a loan to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah will multiply it, increase it many number of times. And I, I'd like to end my talk by giving a quotation from the Quran, from Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 261, which says, the parable of those who spend their substance in the way of Allah is that of a grain of corn. It grows seven years, each year bearing a hundred corn. The Quran says that those who spend their substance in the way of Allah, the parable is that of a grain of corn. It goes seven years, seven butas. Each year having hundred corn means one corn becomes 700 times. One corn, one grain of corn is converted to 700 corn if you spend it in the way of Allah. In short, Allah promises you 700 times profit. In business terminology, you will say 70,000 percent profit. I want to know which business in the world today can give you a profit of 70,000 percent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises you that I will give you 70,000 percent profit, 700 times profit, and Allah does not stop at that. He says, I will give you many fold times more. But for you to do business with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to have taqwa, you have to have faith, you have to have righteousness, you have to have God consciousness. The best bank that you can invest is in the bank of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the best bank. But but natural to invest in that bank, you require taqwa, you require God consciousness, you require piety. Waakrut dawan alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Thank you for that Jazakallah uh, khair, for that uh, very educative talk on the subject of the day. Now we have the question and answer session in which we have an open forum for the audience to put questions to Dr. Zakir Naik on the topic of the day, interest-free economy promulgated by the Quran. You may ask only one question at a time, kindly be brief and to the point. This is a question answer time, not a lecture time. Put forward a question and you'd get a response to that. We have mic arrangements here. For the gents, we have Brother Imran who runs down the aisle with the mic. Anyone requiring to ask a question, would like to ask a question, may kindly raise his hand and 
as per a direction he would be passing on the mic. In the ladies section, we would request the person coordinating there, Sister Farah or whoever, to kindly tap three times on the mic there like this. So I know a question, questioner is ready there and we give them the opportunity. Or she could interject and request when appropriate. Uh, we start the question and answer session with the brother there in the center. Uh, Dr. Dr. Zagar Naik, uh, I want to ask you about uh, the time period you quoted that uh, suppose for two years a certain uh, amount has been invested in the bank and suppose the entrepreneur fails to earn a profit or a loss in the two years and it takes time. So the bank is liable to take the money back or not? The brother posed the question that suppose the bank, Islamic bank, gives a particular amount for two years <coughs> and that businessman fails to make any profit or loss in the two years, does the bank have the right to take back the money? It depends upon the condition. If the term fixed for the loan taken from the Islamic bank is two years, then the bank has a right to take back the money, irrespective of whether it makes a profit or loss. But if the bank feels that if another six months is given to the businessman, maybe he will make a profit, the bank can surely extend the period to two and a half years or to three years, depending upon how, how productive is the business. It depends on the discretion of the bank. Hope that answers the question. But the main difference is that if the loss is there, the businessman in the Mudariba system does not bear the loss. The loss is borne by the bank. So the businessman is yet not going any loss, direct loss. The loss is borne by the Islamic bank. Hope that answers the question. Excuse me, my question to you is the connection with the housing loan and all that is given to uh, people by the banks. Could you please tell what is the system under the Islamic law, under the Islamic banking, which helps people to obtain at least a shelter for themselves? Do I pose a question? That suppose a person, he wants to buy a house. And if he wants a loan, how does the modern bank differ in giving loan for housing as compared to the Islamic bank? The main difference is that in the modern bank, suppose you want a loan for buying a house, but naturally you should have a particular percentage. It may be 25% or 50% of that house or 40%, whatever the bank has its rules, you have to pay of that house. 25%, 40% or 50% of that house, initially you have to pay. The remaining balance, 75% or 60% or 50%, it's paid by the bank. And suppose the house cost for 3 lakhs, or cost for 4 lakhs. The initial 1 lakh you paid, the remaining 3 lakh is paid by the modern bank. And say you want a time period of 5 years. So the modern bank take into account that 3 lakh loan has been taken from the modern bank. You will be repaying it in three years' time. And the interest rate for three years is calculated, whatever the amount will be. It may be 40,000 or 50,000 rupees. So it calculates the initial loan it has given you plus the interest. Say the interest is about 50,000. So the three lakh loan and 50,000 interest is paid in a period of three years. Three lakh 50,000 is paid in installments. This 3,50,000 is divided by the number of months, that is 36 months. So every month you pay an installment of say somewhere around close to 10,000 rupees, 9,500, whatever it is, you pay. So the system of the modern bank is based on interest. The amount it has given you loan and the time period you take, the loan plus interest is the installments you pay. But naturally, since it involves riba, it involves interest, it is haram in Islam. The system of the Islamic banking is different. There are various different types of systems. The loan that you take from the Islamic bank, there are various ways in which you can take loans. Different banks have got different schemes. Some banks have the scheme that suppose you pay part. Again, you have to pay 25% or 40% or 50% of the initial amount of that flat. Out of 4 lakh, you pay 1 lakh. 
the remaining 3 lakh is given to by the Islamic Bank. Now the Islamic Bank calculates that what is the average monthly rent of that house? Say, it may be about 15,000 per month. Since you have paid 25% of the initial amount of that house, and 75% is paid by the Islamic Bank, the rent is divided. 25% of the rent you don't pay, the remaining 75% you pay. Whatever the amount comes to, every month. Since 75% of the house has been financed by the Islamic Bank, 25% by you. So here, you calculate the rent. And at the end of three years, they see to it that suppose they want a particular profit. So the Islamic Bank says, I want a profit of about 40,000 rupees. I want a profit of 30,000 rupees at the end of three months. So three lakhs they have given to you. Plus the 30,000 is added as profit. The 3.3 lakh is divided in the 36 months as installment. But here, it is not calculated on interest, it is calculated on profit. And every month you are paying rent. Every month you are paying rent of that house. That's one of the ways of taking loans. For example, if you go in the Alamin Bank, they have an Ashiana scheme, housing scheme, where you must, suppose you say that after four years I'm going to get married, after three years I'm going to get married. They encourage you to start saving from now. So every month you can deposit either 1,000 rupees, 2,000 rupees or 3,000 rupees of that amount in the Alamin Bank. It goes in the Ashiana scheme. And whatever you deposit, it is invested in the Mudaraba system. And you get profit on that. So at the end of three years, every year you keep on depositing 3,000 rupees, whatever it is. At the end of three years, it becomes three multiplied by 36. It becomes more than one lakh rupees. One lakh eight thousand. And plus the profit. With the profit, it comes to one lakh twenty five thousand or one lakh fifty thousand. So now, the remaining one and a half lakh is given to you by the Alamin Bank. On the same basis which is based on the rent. It's based on profit, it's not based on interest. So anything we deal with interest is haram. Anything we deal with profit and loss is allowed. Hope that answers the question. Any question from the ladies side? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. What are we supposed to do with the interest money we have? Some says you can utilize the interest money for constructing toilet and bathroom. The sister posed the question that what are we supposed to do with the interest money we have? Some say that you can, that you can utilize that money for constructing bathrooms and toilets. Firstly, as a Muslim, you should not involve yourself in interest at all. So if you don't involve yourself in interest, the question of you having interest money does not arise. You are not supposed to keep a single pie in any institute, in any bank which deals with interest. So if you don't keep your money in interest-based institute, you will not have interest money, so the question will not arise, where are you supposed to invest that money? Suppose, today you have decided that Today I have realized that interest is haram, it is prohibited and you say, okay, I will refrain from it. If a person has to repent, there are three criteria required. First, he should realize the thing he is doing is haram, it is prohibited. Second, he should stop it, he should stop it immediately. Third, he should not involve in it in future. So today if you realize that interest is haram and if you have some money remaining with you, then I would say that spend it in the way of Allah. But if you say, I will keep my money in the modern bank in the fixed deposit on the savings account and whatever money I get regularly, whatever money I get every year, I will give it in the way of constructing toilets, constructing bathrooms. Some say you can spend it on footwear. From where they get this, I don't know. Interest is haram and the money of that interest is also haram. I would like to ask a question. That suppose there's a person who's dealing in drugs, who's dealing in cocaine and brown sugar. 
since intoxicant has been prohibited in the Quran, he says that I have invested one lakh rupees in this business of cocaine, of drugs, or I have invested 10 lakh rupees. After investing 10 lakh rupees, every month I get a profit of 1 lakh rupees. And that 1 lakh profit, since dealing in drugs is haram, I don't take a single part of the profit. I spend that 1 lakh rupees for the poor people. Do you think it's allowed in Islam? But nature is not allowed. That since the consumption of intoxicants is haram, Dealing in intoxicants is also haram. You can't say that as a compensation, whatever profit I've got, I spend it for good deed. It's not allowed. In the same fashion, you cannot say I will keep my money in a modern bank, in the saving account of fixed deposit, and whatever money I have, I will spend it on making chapels and building toilets. Same smuggler will say that after I make a profit of one lakh rupees, I will make one toilet in every locality. Do you think it's allowed? He may, in his business of dealing with drugs, he may have ruined hundreds and thousands of lives, which may be costing more than crores of rupees. This one lakh is negligible. So you can't compensate by saying, whatever money I have, I will spend it for building bathrooms or chapels. Interest is haram. You are not supposed to keep your money in any institute which involves with interest. So if you don't have the money, the question of spending it does not arise. But today, if you have decided, that interest is haram, and what a backlog you have, inshallah you can spend in the way of Allah, and Allah will accept it. I hope that answers the question. Next question. Zakir Bhai, you have very well proved that taking interest is prohibited in the Quran and Hadith. I do agree with it. But is giving interest also haram? Brother said that he agrees that since the Quran mentions taking of interest is haram, he says that is giving of interest also haram? <coughs> it is that you ask me the question that since the Quran clearly mentions that intoxicants and gambling, it mentions Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, O you who believe, innam al khamru al maithuru, more certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal anzabu al aslamu. Dedication of stones, divination of arrows. Which some men amali shaitan, these are abomination of Satan's handiwork. First, abstain from such abomination that you may prosper. Since the Quran says alcohol is prohibited, and if I say that okay, consuming alcohol is prohibited, selling is allowed, but natural dealing in any activity of alcohol is prohibited. Since the Quran prohibits it, but there are further details given in various hadiths. For example, if you refer to the hadith related uh, by Anas, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cursed ten groups of people who deal with alcohol. The one who distills it, the one for whom it is distilled, the one who drinks it, the one who transports it, the one who transports it, the one to whom it is brought, the one who sells it. The one who serves it. The one who utilizes the money out of it. The one who buys it. And the one to whom it is bought for. All ten categories of people will be cursed. So when the Quran says it is prohibited, it is prohibited. Same way. I do agree. Quran says in various places, devour not usury, eat not usury, take not usury. So but natural taking is prohibited. But if you would have analyzed, if you would have paid attention, I also mentioned a verse from the Quran, from Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 275, which says that trade is like usury. They say trade is like usury. Tell them, Allah has permitted trade, but forbidden usury. Here it does not mention taking or giving. All sorts of dealing in usury is prohibited. And for more detail, you can refer to the Hadith of Sahih Bukhari, volume number 3. Chapter number 628, Hadith number 3880, which says that Abdullah bin Masood, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that Allah's Messenger, may peace be upon him, he cursed the person who took riba, the person who took interest, and the person who gave interest. In the next Hadith, 
immediately later on of Sahih Muslim, volume 3, chapter number 628, hadith number 3881. It says that Jabir, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that the Messenger of Allah, may peace be upon him, said the curse of Allah is on the person who is the taker of interest, who takes interest, who gives interest, who records interest, and those two witnesses involved, all are equal. The person who gives interest is cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who takes interest. The one who records it is cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and also the two witnesses, even they are cursed for all are equal. Hope that answers the question. Hello. Yeah. Uh, in order to prevent myself, in order to prevent myself from taking interest, why don't I invest in a current account that does not involve any interest? So, how is that different from an Islamic account? But that was the question. That what is the difference between the current account of a modern bank and a current account of an Islamic bank? You can't invest your money in current account because current account does not have any returns. You can keep your money in current account for safekeeping. There's no problem. Islamically wise, if you keep your money in the current account of a modern bank, directly it is not prohibited since it does not deal with interest. But logically, I can give you several reasons why keeping your money in the current account of Islamic bank is more beneficial than a current account of a modern bank. Firstly, though there is no returns in the current account of a modern bank or Islamic bank, there is no returns, no profit, no interest involved, but still, the money that you keep in the modern bank can be utilized for projects which are harmful for society. For example, making gambling dens, for making alcohol factories, all such projects. So in short, you are helping the bank to make the society more bad. If you keep your money in the Islamic current account of Islamic bank, not a single project will be financed which is harmful to the society. All the projects that they finance are permitted by the Sharia. So Muslim will be satisfied. But non-Muslim, he is not bothered with society. He is saying, I care a hand to the society that goes to the dog. I am only bothered about my, the safety of my money. So what the difference? Keeping the money in Islamic bank and a modern bank. Just in case, if you keep your money in a modern bank, and if the bank goes bankrupt, according to the laws of the modern bank, the creditors of the bank get their money first. The depositors get later on. By the time the creditors are paid whatever is due to them, the money is exhausted. So if you keep your money in a modern bank, and if the bank goes bankrupt, there are high chances you will not get your money back. But if you keep your money in Islamic bank, according to the Islamic Sharia law, the depositors get their money first. So if you keep your money in Islamic bank, and even if God forbid that bank goes bankrupt, you will get your money back. Hope that answers the question. So even, even economically wise, keeping in the current account of a modern, of Islamic bank is more safer as compared to keeping in the current account of a modern bank. Hope that answers the question. The next question from the lady sir. Isn't the service charge taken by the Islamic bank similar to the interest charged by the modern bank? Is it in the same concept with the change of words to attract the Muslims? <laughs> Sister posed the question <coughs> that isn't the service charge taken by the Islamic bank the same as the interest charge by the modern bank with the change of word just to attract the Muslims as a bait. Theoretically, if you analyze the interest charge today by the modern bank, it is about 11 percent, I mean sorry, it is about 14 percent to 15 percent. It varies, depends upon a project, 14 to 18 percent, sometimes it's 20 percent. If you want a loan, a particular loan for a particular project, etc. And if you go to Islamic Bank, Islamic Bank has a service charge 
take for example the service charge charged by the barkat investment so the baitun nasar the barkat investment and baitun nasar it is varying from 8% to 15% it vary 8 to 15% but in the past few years it is somewhat similar to 14% so even if you agree that 16% interest charged by the modern bank is somewhat similar to the 14% charged by the islamic bank as service charge it's one and the same unnis bis ka farak hai difference of just a few percentage here and there but the basic concept is the same it is same as interest only a change of word first have to analyze that the service charge charged by the islamic financial institute is based on the profit and loss which the islamic bank has it's not based on interest in the modern bank the interest rate is fixed if it is 16 it will remain 16 in the islamic bank the service charge that they take is based on the profit and loss of the full year of that particular company or that institute and say for example the profit and loss it comes to approximately 13% or 14% so initially they charge 14% at the end of the year they actually calculate the amount of loss and profit in which they have gone and based on that the last monthly installment is given if instead of 14% if they are supposed to be 15% the last installment will be very big if instead of 14% they are supposed to be 12% the last in installment will be negligible it fluctuates but one thing you should realize that if suppose today the islamic concept of banking is not very famous suppose only two people come every day to the islamic bank for taking loan so whatever money is deposited in saving account etc and different account by the depositors they are given as loan to you in that bank 10 people are working so but natural the service charge that they charge you will be depending upon the profit which they are giving to the savings account plus the administration cost of the 10 people which are working in the bank so if only two people come every day to that bank the 10 people salary will be divided between the two people but suppose tomorrow the system gets famous and instead of two people 100 people come to the bank the staff will only be have to be increased say by twice instead of 10 they have to give 20 staff so 20, the salary of 20 people will be divided into 100 people the service charge will go down so if more people have faith in the islamic system of banking but national service charge will come down and they try in the level best to bring it to as low as 8 to 9% which they will but one thing we should realize that if you analyze if you keep in a fixed deposit account in islamic investment company say the barkat investment no no investment today in india is a full fledged islamic bank because the rbi does not give it permission to function as a bank they can only function as an investment finance institute they can't issue checks the rbi does not give it permission whatever little bit islamic banking they are following the islamic investment for example the barkat investment if you put your money in the system of musharaka mudarib a fixed deposit they give you a return of between 16 to 20% and the cost shows that once they get 16 once they get 17 and a half once they get 19 say for example barkat investment gave 19% profit the service charge that the bank is charging you if you take a loan from baitun nasar which is the sister concern of barkat investment they are only charging you 14% so if you are clever what you can do you can keep your 1 lakh rupees invested in barkat investment get 19000 rupees out of 1 lakh rupees fine and same time since you want the 1 lakh rupees back you can also take a loan from baitun nasar on the deposit which you have for 1 lakh rupees and pay only for only 14% percent of service charge so indirectly when you when you keep your 1 lakh rupees you are getting a return of 19000 rupees that same 1 lakh can also be obtained on the same day from baitun nasar and you are paying only 14% 14000 at the end of year without involving a little bit risk also you are making a profit of 5000 rupees but they see to it that people don't try and fool 
But if you analyze, the profit that you get from the Barakat investment is 19%. The service charge is 14%. It's not related at all. In the modern bank, it is related. It is directly related. That the interest which the bank pays on fixed deposit may be 10 to 11%. And when you take a loan, they charge 16%. The person who takes a loan always pays 4 to 5 percent more than what they give to the depositors. In the Islamic bank, it did not be that same. So, service charge and the interest is a world of a difference. If you want to lower the service charge, what we have to do? We have to convince more Muslims to have faith in this bank and invest more money. Inshallah, service charge will come down. I hope that answers the question. Next question. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Dr. Bakre, he studied the economic system of Vedas. He says, he says that uh, in Vedas, there is also same economic system, interest-free economy. And he also claims that you implement in India that system, the economic in imbalance, we can uh, make our society economically balanced. So, exactly in Vedas, actually same system of uh, economic uh, is there, if there is the same system as of uh, Quran, then can we say that writer of that Veda is uh, one of the prophets of Islam? Brother, for the question, person by the name of Dr. Bakr. Bakre. That's why the correct pronunciation is Hemji Bokre. He has said that even the Veda speaks about an interest-free economy. Is it the same as mentioned in the Quran? And if it's the same, is the author of the Vedas one of the prophets of God? Here in the first question, is it the same? I do agree that even the Vedas do specify about an interest economy. Even the Quran specifies the same. How you implement it can be differ. It can differ. As long as the system you're running is an interest fee system, the way of method of running can differ. This method has been devised by various people, which they have read various historical books from the hadiths and the implementation of the various economists. Even the Vedas say it should be interest free. As long as the economy is interest free, inshallah it will be sustainable. Regarding the second part of the question, that if it's the same, does it mean that the Veda is the revelation of God? Or does it mean that the author of the Veda is the prophet of God? One thing we should realize that before the Quran was revealed, there were several other revelations that came on the face of the earth. By name we know four. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, and the Furqan. The Furqan is the Quran. The Torah is the revelation which we believe, a Wahi, which was revealed to Musa alayhi salam. Moses may peace be upon him. A Zabur is the Wahi, is the revelation which was revealed to Dawud alayhi salam. David may peace be upon him. Injil is the Wahi, is the revelation revealed to Isa alayhi salam, Jesus may peace be upon him. And Furqan, that is the Quran, is the last and final revelation which was revealed to the last and final messenger Muhammad may peace be upon him. Before this, maybe many revelations were there which we do not know name of. Four, we surely know by name. Messengers in the Quran are mentioned 25 by name. Adam, Abraham, Moses, David, Solomon, Jesus, Muhammad, may peace be upon them all. My name 25. In the Hadith, we find 99 by name. But there were more than 1,20,000 prophets and messengers. As the Quran says, we have sent to every nation and a guide. Every nation we have sent a guide. The same way, there can be other scriptures also. Revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not written by prophets, revealed by Allah. But if you ask me, if a few points coincide in the Bible and the Quran, can you say Bible is the word of God? If a few points coincide with the Vedas, can you say it's the word of God? No, you cannot say. You cannot say. If a few points are coinciding, what you can say? It can be from God, maybe it's not from God. Even if it's from God, you don't have to agree with it. It's not the, fi it's not the last and final revelation. The last revelation is the Quran. And Quran clearly states, in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 106, we have substituted our signs with other signs which are similar or better. 
even if a few things matches the Quran, you can say maybe they are remnants of the Word of God. For example, there are many things which in the Bible which match with the Quran. What we can say that maybe the Bible contains part, partly it contains the Word of God. It may contain a few verses of the Injil, but we can't say the full Bible is the Word of God. Same way, neither can we say the Veda is the Word of God. Maybe it contains a few revelations from God. Maybe I'm not saying surely. Bible, I can say surely, few words of Injil because the word Injil is mentioned in the Quran that it is the revelation of God. Regarding where that's not mentioned in the Quran. So maybe it is. Even if it is, we don't have to bother. We have to believe in the last and final revelation of Allah SWT, that's the Quran. Hope that answers the question. Dr. Zakir Naik, how about working in the bank? So that's the question, how about working in the bank? Okay, I'm a Muslim, work in a modern bank. Bank means modern or Islamic? Which bank? Modern bank or Islamic bank? Modern bank. The brother wants to know that is it fine, is it okay if you work in a modern bank? As I mentioned, anything dealing with riba is prohibited. Whether you give riba or take riba or record riba. I had given a quotation from Sai Muslim. Volume number 3, chapter number 628, hadith number 3881, which says that Jabir may Allah be pleased with him. He said that Allah's messenger may peace be upon him, cursed those people who took interest, who gave interest, who recorded it, and the two witnesses, all are alike. All are cursed. In the bank are recording the witness. So from Sahih Muslim, it is clearly prohibited. Working in a modern bank is prohibited. Anyone who gives a witness, giving a surety is also prohibited. But, if you ask me, that today I'm working in a modern bank, what am I to do? I wouldn't tell you that leave immediately. If you have any other option, Alhamdulillah, leave it immediately. Because, what you should do, you should try and find another substitute. You should leave the job which you're doing and find another job. But unfortunately, I know many people who say, that I want to leave the modern bank since two years. I've got no option. The reason is, today they're drawing 4,000 rupees salary per month. They are getting other jobs, but they're getting only 3,000 rupees. Instead of saying that I do not get a salary equivalent to the salary I get in modern bank, they say they've got no option. Of course they have an option. They can surely look for other jobs, but they're afraid that instead of earning 4,000, they will earn 3,000. So in short, they want to make more money. And they're challenging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a war. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Rasul. So, if you're working in a modern bank, what I'd advise you, that as soon as possible, try and find another job. Even if it's less paying, inshallah, you may never know, you may get, any, you may get a much higher salary paid job later on. Or even if you don't get in this life, you'll surely get the reward in the year after. You will not be among the companions of the hellfire, and you will get minimum 700 times a turn if you spend in the way of Allah. But if today, if you say that I am working in a modern bank so that I understand the system of the modern economics, so in future, after a year or so, I can start an Islamic bank. If your niyat is to start an Islamic bank, for that you are in a modern bank, then inshallah Allah will forgive you. Because the main intention is to learn the modern economics so that you can implement the Islamic economic in a better way. In the same fashion, if you say that is it fine working in an alcohol shop, I would say it's haram. But if you say, I want to work in that alcohol shop for two, three months, so that later on I can stop that alcohol shop or convert it into a medical store, I feel, inshallah, Allah will support you. So if you're working in the bank to convert that modern bank to Islamic bank, inshallah, I'll forgive you. But if you work it only for the salary, if you work in that bank only for the salary, Allah will never forgive you. Hope that answers the question. Question from the lady side. Kiran, yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Naik, uh, uh, in, uh, apne, in the Quran, uh, riba is mentioned, and riba means usury. So interest can be a part of riba. And there are other uh, parts uh, that is for forms of usury. 
So, if a project is to be passed uh, for trade is going on, and there are uh, various bureaucratic cycles here in India, we've got to pass through the projects, and uh, it requires bribes and all that. So, if in doing so, if we put that money into that, and return we get the profit by giving bribes and uh, okaying the thing from the officers and all, and uh, is that usury or what? So, I pose a question that since we are living in a system which involves a lot of interest and if we involve, if you do a business project, whatever reba money you get, you can use it for bribing. No, uh, the question is that suppose we take the money from a bank, from an Islamic bank and uh, we, for a business and for the... Take business, the money from Islamic bank. From an Islamic bank and uh, if we want to uh, pass some projects and all, it goes into the bureaucratic circles and uh, we've got to pay some bribe from that, from mm. that money. So is that, is that money also that profit comes it comes into account or riba or what? Is bribing allowed or not? In short, if whatever money you take from the bank with that halal money from the bank, can you bribe? In short, can you account? Can you account it? Yeah. I mean, suppose if I if I total make a profit fifty thousand rupees or a fifty thousand rupees profit, I have given five thousand rupees bribe. So can you say that instead of fifty thousand profit, I have got forty five thousand rupees thousand profit? Correct. Instead of fifty thousand, five thousand goes for bribe. So deduct that from the profit, and the balance profit, net profit is only forty-five thousand rupees. Correct? Brother, firstly, you should realize that bribing is haram in Islam, irrespective of whether it's some haram money or halal money. Accountability comes later on. Accountability comes later on. You are not allowed to bribe. It's clearly mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number one hundred and eighty-eight. It says that squander not your wealth amongst yourself in vanities, not use it, nor use it as a bait to the judges. Bait to the judges means bribe. Do not use your wealth as a bait to the judges, so that you may eat up other people's property knowingly or unknowingly. You give a bribe, so that you eat other people's property. It's haram in Islam. Quran prohibits it. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 188. And again, it says giving bribery is haram. You say, can I take bribery? Again, refer to the hadith. It's clearly mentioned in the hadith of Ahmad that anyone who takes bribe, who gives bribe, and the middle band, all three are cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So bribing is haram. The question does not arise whether you can account for it or not. Islamically wise, you can't bribe. If you tell that Islamic banker, I'm going to bribe, he'll say, then don't take the money. In India, they may allow you, I don't know. In Islamic Sharia. Actual Sharia, if you say, I want to use that money for making alcohol factory, it's haram. Alcohol is haram, you can't utilize that money for alcohol factory. If you say, I want to utilize the money for bribing, under the Islamic law, you can't use that money for bribing. Unknowingly do it, if you cheat them, fine, you can't cheat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So bribing is haram, irrespective whether it's accountable or not, it's haram. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, a question from the lady side. Is insurance allowed in Islam, especially life insurance? If not, is there any other alternative or any Islamic solution to it? <coughs> Sister posed the question that is life insurance allowed? Is insurance allowed? It's special life insurance. And if it's not allowed, is there any other alternative or is there any other solution? The concept of insurance is a very old concept. With the people of the community, they pull in the money and the money is utilized at the eleventh hour. Maybe you have an accident and case of emergency, that pooled money is utilized. It's a very good concept. But coming to life insurance, is it allowed? According to a fatwa given by Maulana Muhammad Abu Zahar of Egypt, he said, that insurance on cars for its repairs is lawful, though in itself it is unlawful. The insurance on the cars for its repairs is lawful, though in itself it is unlawful. Overall, it's allowed. As a system, insurance, the way it operates is unlawful. But for cars and repairs, it's allowed. But life insurance, in which you give a monthly installment, give a monthly installment and if any mishap takes place you get your full amount or double the amount and at the end if you survive you get your full amount along with profit this is nothing but riba 
So in short, any investment, whether it be life insurance or car insurance or property insurance, if it involves riba, it is haram. Any investment which deals riba, it's haram. Today that we have today, the life insurance comp corporation, as far as my knowledge goes, the major of the investment is in fixed money market. That is, it is interest based. So whatever money, suppose you record a policy of about 1 lakh for about 10 years. So each year you keep on paying 1 lakh rupees. Each year. So each month you pay an installment of a particular 1000 rupees. And if you die of an accident in between, even though you have paid only 2 months installment, you get double the amount. You get 20 lakh rupees. If you die a natural death, you get the full amount before maturity. But if you survive for 10 years without dying, you get your full 10 lakh rupees along with profit. Now where do they give this profit from? The major investment of the life insurance corporation here is in fixed money market, which is riba based, interest based, it's haram. If you know of any institute which gives insurance, which is not based on money market, but based on shares, equity it's allowed. Recently, a few days ago, I came across a form called the Golden Bond, which operates in London, in England. There, you invest an amount. The minimum amount that you have to invest there is two and a half thousand pounds. That's about 1.25 lakh rupees. And after you invest the, that amount, they take that money and invest it in shares and equity, which is allowed in Islam. Shares and equity. They don't invest in fixed money market. And they say that they will give you a return of approximately 7.5%. Approximately. And they give an additional facility that in case if you die, you get an extra bonus. So these sort of investment, which does not deal with riba, it's allowed. But the present life insurance, as far as my knowledge goes, it deals mainly in fixed money market, which is not allowed. It is haram. Insurance not dealing in fixed money market, not dealing with riba, it's allowed. If you're dealing with riba, it's haram, this is in short. Regarding is there any alternative? Is there any Islamic solution? Can you have a life insurance company based only on the Sharia? Like how you have the Islamic banking based on Sharia? Can you have a life insurance company based only on Sharia? Yes, why not? You can have. And a very good solution was given by Mufti Muhammad Shafi of Karachi, Darul Ulm of Pakistan. He said that we can surely have a life insurance system based on the Islamic Sharia. He says that how you give monthly premium, monthly installment life insurance, you also in the Islamic life insurance, you keep on paying a monthly, a, a certain amount. That amount which you give as monthly installment is invested in the Mudaraba system. Now whatever, whatever profit that you get from the money invested, a particular share, say one fourth or one third of the profit, you keep it separately as waqf. Your initial amount is invested in the Mudariba system. Whatever profit you have, one third or one fourth, keep it separately as waqf. Now, if suppose any of the shareholders, any people who are involved with life insurance company, which is Islamically based, if they have some problem like accident, you can give the medical aid from that waqf. And you can keep a fixed limit that if certain factor takes place, you give a certain amount. If that takes place in accident, you give a certain amount. If that takes place with a disease, you give a certain amount. You can lay down the condition. Islam gives you permission that you're allowed to utilize your own waqf money since it's part of your profit, which is pooled. But there can be loopholes. In the modern system of life insurance company that you have, you have to pay monthly installment. And if you stop paying the monthly installment, all your previous money is gone, is null and void. They do not give a single pie back. If you stop paying the monthly installment, the premium, all your previous money that were put in the life insurance corporation, it is forfeited. Islam does not allow you to forfeit anyone else's money. But if you don't have this rule, People will invest in the life insurance company according to the Sharia. Say if it's for five years, six years, they may stop paying after five months or six months. So you can make a format that anyone who invests, the scheme should be for approximately five years or seven years or ten years. 
If you stop paying anything in between, you will only get your capital sum after five years, after ten years. Keep a fixed period. When you start paying today, after five months you stop paying. You will not get your money back immediately. You will only get after five years, after ten years, whichever has been laid down on the Sharia board of that company. And secondly, if you stop paying before reaching half the time stipulated, so the insurance policy is for five years or ten years, if it's for five years, if you stop paying before two and a half years, then all the profit of your money, which you paid for one year or two years, is profited. But the capital sum you'll get back after five years or after ten years. But if you stop paying after half the time, you'll get the profit. So it is also very much viable. It's possible to run a life insurance company based on the Islamic Sharia. I hope that answers the question. Now I'd call upon Professor Hamza Virani. Uh, Shwe, is it? Yeah, I'd call upon Dr. Shweb to uh, present any question? To present the vote of thanks. I, on behalf of Islamic Research Foundation, first of all, thank God Almighty and then all of you for having this beautiful session and followed by a question and answer session also. Inshallah, next Sunday, same timing at 10.45 a.m., there will be a symposium on the subject of Was Christ Crucified, shared by Professor Hamza Virani and inshallah myself. There will be again a session on Saturday a video cassette. Zafar Mukadam will be delivering a lecture inshallah. Saturday afternoon 2.45 p.m. Those coming for the first time to the organization are requested to fill up the response card and can collect the free literature that we distribute from here. Thank you very much. Jazakallah khair. On Saturday, for the Saturday program, I'd like to clarify, we'll have the ladies sitting down the auditorium. Usually we have the Saturday programs, uh, which will be more of a ladies-based program. We'll have the ladies in the auditorium down. And gents, we have made arrangements on the top. There'll be an audio-video connection. Of course, as usual, like at present, we have the ladies on the top. On Sundays, we have the gents down. It will be reversed on Saturdays, so that uh, we invite more ladies are invited on Saturday. And topics we have which would be have uh, more relevance and interest to uh, sisters. And on Sundays we have a general topic for everyone. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Allah, 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 Allah,